In this lecture, we'll take a look at some of the ethical issues in computing. Most of this course has focused on the technical issues of computing. However, we're now going to focus more on the human issues lurking behind these technical details. We can't provide a comprehensive list of such issues because that would just take way too long. And this list is actually growing daily. So instead, we're going to introduce skills that uh, will help with thinking and uh, reasoning carefully when making personal decisions about computing. Uh, we're also going to discuss some of the important societal issues related to information technology and personal privacy, and we'll point towards some of the resources to help with exploring some of these issues in greater detail. In fact, making critical decisions uh, about computer technology is it's unavoidable. You're going to be making critical decisions no matter what goes on. So, uh, and in fact, our society is being driven by the access and the control of information. So as citizens of our communities in our country and of the world, uh, we want our decisions to be uh, well informed and we want to make sure that they're well reasoned. Whenever humans make decisions about things that they value, there are conflicts and trade-offs. The scholarly field of ethics has a long history of studying how to identify and resolve such conflicts. And we're gonna borrow from several classical theories of ethics. So what we're gonna do here is we're going to discuss uh, several case studies that are built around complex ethical issues related to computing and information. For each case study, we'll present the issues as well as arguments used to support and oppose certain positions. We'll then describe the methods that allow us to understand and evaluate these arguments in terms of their ethical implications. So by the time we're done with this, you should have at least an increased appreciation for the complexities of human computer interactions, as well as an enhanced set of skills for thinking and reasoning about these interactions. We'll start by discussing the first case study, which involves MP3s. In 1987, some scientists in Germany started working on an algorithm to compress digital files that stored recorded music on CDs. And using a complex model of how humans perceive the sound, uh, Germany devised a method with a really weird title. They called it the Moving Picture Experts Group Audio Layer 3. That was too long, so this algorithm was nicknamed MP3 to, to make it easier. Um, now, in 1989, uh, this group in Germany uh, patented the MP3, and a few years later, MP3 became an international standard. It might simply have become another technical detail only known to a few engineers had it not been for the World Wide Web and a bunch of young people who were very enthusiastic about recorded music. So in 1997, um, there was a software developer at Advanced Multimedia Products who uh, created what is regarded as the first commercially available MP3 uh, playback program. Now, there were a couple of students um, at the University of Utah who took this player and developed a user-friendly uh, version of it that worked on Windows. And this was called WinAmp that played MP3 music. And this was offered for free on the internet in 1998. All of a sudden, MP3 became very, very well known. Prior to the release of WinAmp, there had been some sharing of digital music from copyrighted CDs. Uh, however, uncompressed sound files produced from traditional CDs were pretty massive, and internet speeds back then were pretty bad. Because remember, we're, we're talking about that 56K uh, bit per second modem, and this was the most widely used communication link on the internet during the late 1990s. So transferring these files back then was very slow, very clumsy. But because MP3 sound files were a lot smaller and internet connections were getting faster, especially in university computer labs, sharing MP3 music files became increasingly popular. And I mean, they're a lot easier, more popular. And you can uh, take a wild guess that the companies that were selling music CDs uh, were getting a little worried about it. In the spring of 1999, two Northeastern University students created a file sharing system that spread quickly over the internet. Uh, this was called Napster. I'm sure you've heard this before, and it was very a very popular 
file sharing uh, program. And it was originally used by college students. Uh, in fact, it became so popular that several universities noticed their campus networks were slowing to a crawl because of student MP3 downloads. Now, Napster was a wonderful example of how technical details about computer systems can have significant social effects. So the software set up what's called a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, file sharing. So let me explain how this works. So let's say I have two users, A and B. Uh, user A would submit a list of songs that they want to share on a central server. So the server would just contain the list of songs. And then we can have uh, user B log onto the server to see what songs are available and where they're located. Now this would include the songs listed by user A and all the songs listed by other users as well. So let's suppose user B picks a song from user A's list. So when user B would pick the song, the user B would re request the song from the user, and this would, this would establish a direct connection between users A and B. So user A would upload the song while user B would download the song. So it's basically saying we're copying the song from user A and giving it to user B. So then when this is done, user B now has a copy of the song and then that user can play it on his or her computer. On December 7, 1999, an organization of recording companies filed suit against Napster in the U.S. District Court on the grounds of copyright infringement. During the highly publicized arguments that followed, the recording companies insisted that Napster was a conspiracy to encourage mass infringement of U.S. copyright law. By most accounts, most of the a uh, vast majority of the mp3 music that Napster users were sharing was in fact copyrighted and most of the copyright holders uh, were very much against having their uh, music being copied without any royalty payments. Now there were some artists that wanted their music copied but they were in the, the minority. In defense, the supporters of Napster uh, argued that the Napster system was just merely acting as a common carrier, much like a telephone company. They claimed that Napster was simply providing information on songs and their location and did not participate in the actual exchange of copyrighted information. They argued that Napster couldn't be held responsible for what peers did with that information in the peer-to-peer -peer file sharing system. In addition, uh, Napster also contended that peer-to-peer -peer copying was very similar to a user making a backup copy of a file. Uh, it pointed out that uh, copyright laws allow a person who has purchased a recording in one format to transfer it to a different format as long as it was for personal use and it was not resold. Uh, so Napster claimed that both peers in each swap were just transferring a file without any payment to each other or to Napster and therefore the copying should be considered fair use. Well, the law didn't really buy this defense and eventually Napster lost the case and all subsequent appeals. So it eventually ceased operating as a file sharing site in 2001. Although it did open, uh, or I should say reopen, as a commercial music downloading service, but eventually the name did disappear. However, there were new peer-to-peer -peer file sharing systems that sprang up on the web and illegal mp3 music sharing through the internet did continue uh, March, much of the charging of uh, recording companies. One such example of this was Kazaa. Now legal purchasing and downloading of mp3 music has also become very popular. Uh, one such example is Apple iTunes. Uh, they account for more than 25 percent of music sales in the US and several years ago I mean it's already sold more than billions and billions and billions of downloads but music isn't the only issue. Uh, movie file swapping it has become uh, quite common, both legal and illegal. Taking copyrighted photographs off the web for personal use is also a regular occurrence. Uh, so, I mean, here we're, we're, we're still seeing this issue of being able to download and share copyrighted material. So it's not just music, but also movies and photos. So with that said, we're going to concentrate on a question that isn't exactly a 
So if we have a legal question, we'll take it to a judge or a lawyer. If we have a technical question, we'll take it to a scientist or an engineer. So who do we go to for ethical questions? Well, we look to ethicists for guidance about getting a particular answer to an ethical question. Now we define ethics as the study of how to decide if something is morally right or wrong. A fundamental question in ethics is what criteria do we use when measuring the rightness or wrongness of a particular act. Now over the, the centuries, ethicists have championed uh, different criteria and developed schools of thought about how to label an act as good or bad or better or worse. So we're going to be taking a look at two different schools in uh, particular. We're going to take a look at consequentialism and we'll then take a look at utilitarianism. Consequentialism is one of the most influential schools of thought. And as the name implies, uh, a consequentialist focuses on the consequences of an act to determine if the act is good or bad. If the consequences are on the whole good, then the act is considered good. But if the consequences are mostly bad, then the act is bad. Now, however, um, in focusing on the goodness of an act, we do kind of have to consider good for whom. So, for example, in our MP3 example, the copying is certainly good for people who get free music, but it's also pretty bad for uh, copyright holders because they're convinced that MP3 copying is bad. So determining whether a consequence is good or bad is really going to depend on who receives that consequence. The most well-known consequentialists are actually utilitarians. So they answer the question of good for whom with a very simple answer, good for everyone. So they look at what is good for everyone as a whole. So you can kind of think of it as just being able to calculate human happiness. So they take a look at the uh, happiness of humans before something happens, and then they calculate the happiness of everyone after the event occurs, long enough for the consequences to actually take place. Uh, so then once we have that, then they can determine what is considered good. So here, the act is good if the overall happiness of everyone is actually higher after the fact. But if the overall happiness of everyone actually decreased, then they would say that the act is considered bad. Now you may think, okay, how do we actually calculate happiness? Uh, last time I checked, there is not a happiness calculator. So quantifying happiness is not an easy uh, task. I mean, clearly using this, the criterion requires subjective judgments, but making consequences count and ensuring that all people are taken into account when making an ethical judgment does seem like a good idea. So what we're going to do here is we're going to come up with utilitarian arguments to explore whether mass copying of MP3 music files is right. So we'll start by building a utilitarian argument that says that such copying is okay, and then we're gonna build a second utilitarian argument that says such copying is not okay.